All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Bread for Soul Convos with myself, say LSG. This is a pre-recorded episode, uh, but nonetheless, it's a, a super special one for me. I've got on the other line, DJ Black Coffee, you know, a legend, an icon. And if I could mention how I've grown to view life and some of the things that have grown me and my progress is um, your story, brother, it's like, um, it's an inspirational one, you know, and I'm short of <laughs> words to even describe how I feel like talking to you. But I just want to know from you, do you ever reflect, do you have time to reflect and, and see how come, how far you've come? Um, is it is it always clear or, or is it always about the big vision that's coming next? Are you always on the go like that? Or do you have some time to, to look back? Um, man, thank you. Thank you for having me, you know. Um, I like your show. You know, I'm a big fan. I've been watching, like, a couple of episodes. Thank you. Um, I, I just think uh, it's it's important, you know, for our space, for what we do, to have these conversations and um, listen to each other, be inspired by each other. And so thank you for having me. I'm really honored oh, to be here. Thank you, brother. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I do, um, uh, reflect, you know, um, um, but I, at the same time, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a goal driven person, you know, so I'm always, um, thinking of how do I, first of all, I grew up in a space where my mind was just exposed to my surroundings, you know. Um, I moved there when I was eight from Mlaz. And um, being, being around that kind of environment limits your thinking and your, your drive. Well, at least for me. And... Um, so it took me a while to figure out my full potential, you know, and as soon as I realized that I could open my, my mind and uh, think further than my surroundings and want to do better than I thought I, I would do, I wanted to do more. So I always challenge myself to do to do better, you know. Like I just I want to do the the best, mm. you know. Mm. I don't want to be the best. I just want to do my best. Mm. I, I've heard um, a, a friend of mine was telling me that I mean th this is like years ago, and and he you guys worked together, Ravgam, and he was saying that it's it's no surprising, you know, it's not surprising to see the success that you have because already back then you had the vision to say you're gonna do this you know you're gonna play on the yeah. bigger stages how important yeah. is having the vision in your mind like because the way you explained it um in an interview with a resident advisor you said that you had pictures of michael jackson or you had dreams of michael jackson visiting you in your in your in your space yeah. how important yeah. is it having that clear vision in your dream it's crazy, man. Uh, I just feel like whatever that's happening to us as people, uh, it's meant to happen. You know, it, it's it's written. You know, it, all we have to do is um, tap into a certain space in our minds, in, in our brains, and understand our calling. You know, I laugh about that Michael Jackson thing because it's something that's been happening, you know, not only the Michael Jackson level, you know, like um, different uh, American superstars have come, you know, and they come here and we hang out like the same way I, I, I thought about when I was a kid, you know. Uh, the other time Asha was here, I was going to a gig in Manly. Uh, he was like, I'm coming with you. So I went to pick him up at the hotel. You know, like no bodyguards, it's just me and him. We drove, we were still working on the song. We're listening to our song on the, on the, on the way. Mm -hmm. You know, we get to a gig, 
I play, he's right next to me, he's dancing to the music, we drive back to Joburg, you know. So in that sense, it, you know, it's like that, that's the Michael Jackson story, you know. It's like coming back and it's, it's happening on a different level, mm. you know. So I feel like all the things are just there. All we need to do is just understand, you know, if God is going to show you a glimpse of what can happen to you. It's like meeting a guy you've never met before and he's almost your age, you know, but he's done so much, you know, and he's found his calling. You go, you see his house, you're like, wow, you know, uh, God doesn't show you that for nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, the minute you see it and you start thinking about it, you know, um, it means you can do it. Mm -hmm. You were there for a reason, you know, so I have seen so much, you know, in my career, you know, even with my work, I travel and, you know, I have people booking me like private jets to fly from one country to the other. I land, a helicopter picks me up. I land on the guy's home. You know, I play the gig, the helicopter is waiting. In the backyard, it takes me back to the airport. I'm like, there's no way God is showing me all this thing for nothing. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, yo, brah, sorry to cut you, but I, I want to understand, right? So when, when something like that happens for the first time, and you're like, oh my goodness, like, how, what is going through your mind? Besides knowing that you visionized this thing, like you, you, no. you, you've in, engraved it in your mind that you are going to uh, achieve these goals. But to actually, Man, to actually see it. It's amazing, you know. Like I said, it's because it's not just me, you know. Uh, it's God at work, you know. Uh, that's why we, all the things that we really want, all of them, everything that we, like, you really, really want, you get it. Doesn't matter what it is in your lifetime. It could be the smallest thing. You know, it could be growing up uh, without shoes and all you want to own one day is a cavella. Mm. You, you, you're going to get it. Sure. So mm. then what's your version of a cavella then? Mm. You know, what's your version of um, something different that you really, really want? You know, so some of us have bigger responsibilities, you know, um, that... I, can, I feel mine stay with me and they don't leave me, you know, like I can't escape them. You know, I think um, I, I was put in, in, in this space where I am to, to change a certain thing, things in, 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 in my lifetime, you know, and I think uh, everything that has happened in my life has been preparing me, you know, uh, to to have that thick skin, to grow, to understand, and you know, and and be able to get to where God wants me to be, you know. So every day, I know, like, I have to keep moving. You know, there's a lot of setbacks that come, but I know I have to keep moving because my journey is. Uh, uh, quite an intense one, and it just doesn't involve me alone, mm. you know. Uh, so aside of achieving things for myself, uh, there's things that I need to achieve for my generation. Mm. And um, your your journey has been documented, you know, to, to some extent. Like, we, we see your, your success, we see how you started, you know, like, and all of, some of the, most of the, let me say moments, those junctures that really made a, a big impact into, well, on our scene or internationally, when you talk about the 60 hours that you did, uh, and you talk about yeah. Africa rising, and will we ever see a, a proper documentary of DJ Black Coffee? Yeah, yeah. Um, we actually are working on one now. Um, for the past two, three years, we have been documenting like certain things, like even the making of the song subconsciously that you were talking about. We had a camera crew. Uh, I have a lot of like things that like I have um, 
recorded, you know, just to add to the story. You know, there was a time where I had a camera crew following me. I remember being in the studio with Puff Daddy, and we were working on 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 Casey's music. You know, um, I took a crew back to uh, Mtata to record like my childhood story, where I come from, and so I have been recording stuff. Uh, there's still more stuff that I feel like I need to add as my journey continues. You know, I, I kind of like even feel like that documentary will be a like a part one. You know, uh, here's a funny story. I about five years ago, I was with my family staying in in LA for the summer, and we we were out for dinner, and um, then we saw this kid who was wearing a Crawford tracksuit uh, pants, actually written Crawford. You know, and so we saw him. I was like, wow, this. South African kid. So I went to him, you know, he was alone. And I was like, yo, uh, where are you from? He says, no, I'm from South Africa and uh, from Pretoria. You alone? He said, come, come sit with us. He was 18, this boy. And so he sat with us, we were talking, what are you doing in LA? He says, no, I work for Lionsgate. Um, um, the TV, oh, sorry, movie production. Mm. It's a big thing. You're 18. I mean, how come? You know. Mm. And then he's like, "No, actually, um, that's what I tell everyone." But uh, I'm here to do a Elon Musk movie. Mm. Um, I'm like, I don't understand. Sure. You know, he says, "No, I'm an assistant director sure. on an Elon Musk movie." <laughs> You know, um, but you 18, you know. Yeah. There's ever since, you know, he got to know what Elon Musk, he, he, he just followed him, researched him. And one day, I don't know, through a family member, he got to meet Elon Musk. And when he met him, he told him that, I want to make a movie about you. And Elon Musk was like, oh, really? Okay. Then they flew the kid to LA. But because he's a kid, they couldn't make him a director. Mm. You know, this is five years ago. And then they were saying the movie was going to come out the following year because they've been shooting. Mm. And But looking at like what Elon Musk has been doing, mm. you can't do a movie on Elon Musk yet. <laughs> you know, the other day he just launched a rocket to space. Yeah. No, uh, the other time, like last year, sometime he flew a car to space. There's a car floating in space. You, you, it's like we should we release it? No, I have more to do. You know, I feel like my story is like that. Like there's so much that I'm, I'm still trying to do. That we wait for it. You know, like if we say we're gonna wait till the end of the year, then we do, and then the following year, like around March, we're planning something else. And then we continue, and then we say, okay, end end of the year, we want to do something else. You know, like one of the things we were planning to do um, this year was um, performance in in New York um, at the oh, what is this place? Right, Trevor Noah just did a show. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna remember it. Um, the Garden. Um, I'm going to remember it. Okay. But this year we were supposed to do that. So we thought uh, Medicine Square Garden. Medicine, so yeah, yeah. That's what we wanted to do by the end of the year. And so we were like, let's hold on to that kind of a show before we wrap up the shoot, you know. Mm. So there's so much that one is still working on and w wants to do, you know. But yeah, I'm definitely working on a documentary. I feel like because you seem like somebody who's always shifting the goalposts, you know, you reach this goal and then, ah, there's a bigger goal, guys. I don't know. Yeah, to <laughs> me, like, one of them, it's like some are for me, some are for the greater good, uh, you know. There's, there's two stories in my life. Like, there's one that is for me where I'm like, yo, personally, uh, what am I looking for? <laughs> By the end of the year, I want to buy myself a nice watch. Sure. 
you know. So I go work, you know, mm. and then there's like, what can I do that will change um, the cause of our people? Mm. What can I do that will change the landscape of our music industry? Uh, what can I do to help our um, genre of music, our music culture? What can I do to um, change how the world sees Africa? Mm. These are all the things that are, I constantly work on, you know. So in between just me filling my cup, there's other things like mm. that uh, I feel like are my responsibility. Mm. I love that, brother. Um, I've got a voice note here uh, uh, for you, addressed to you yeah. by a friend of mine. I'm going to play it, then we get back to, to the interview. Right, Morning, Lisejo. Morning, Nati. Congratulations, Lisejo. I think we can safely say this experimental format, format of yours has achieved, achieved some significant, significant success, success with your test this best. morning. And also because you've managed to get me to send my first ever voice note. You asked me to chat a little bit about our work together in the past. Uh, I think we covered that in some detail last week, and I may have said too much. But one thing I regret failing to do was to mention the contribution of Brendan Jury and the orchestration of that show. But while we're here, and you have the uh, opportunity to ask this question, you know, the relationship that we built through Africa Rising gave me a front row seat on the most meteoric rise I've ever seen in the entertainment business. And if I can just select a segment out of that, to give people an indication and, uh, and lay out a question for you. You know, the debut in Ibiza was a really big deal and uh, that led quite quickly to the difficult decision you had to make which made you available for the closing of Ushuaia, which then led on to uh, the launch of your residency and uh, I had the, the privilege of attending the opening night of that residency as well as uh, your very kind, life-changing invitation to perform um, on the closing night. But that whole segment of time actually involved a huge degree of acceleration for you personally in your life and career. And I think uh, people uh, have a sense of how well you've done, but there is uh, no real view of the challenge of managing that level of acceleration in your life, while at the same time having a balance in terms of your creative output. So perhaps you'd like to talk around that for a few minutes and give people an insight into what it's taken for you to manage that unbelievable um, kind of g-force of acceleration that you've gone through because you know your view on that is quite instructive to anybody who's aspiring to these kinds of heights it doesn't come free and uh, my uh, point to you has always been your success has followed on from hard work i'm extremely proud of you and i have to say that your recent uh, acquisition of shares in Gallo is precisely the outcome that we always discussed around Africa Rising. And it's where your leadership role overshadows all of the, you know, the other aspects of being famous. It's the, about providing an actual outcome. So while we're here, let me just say in front of everyone again, congratulations, that is a spectacular move. All right. Sure, that was uh, DJ strategy, right? Yeah, man. Wow. This, this, this is quite touching, you know. Um, wow. Um, look, being a DJ from South Africa is the one thing that we, we possess and it's, it's talent. You know, music is in our veins. Um, we have a lot of DJs here and we have the best DJs in the country. So, uh, when you are given residency in Ibiza as, as a best DJ, what can you improve? You know, um, it took, it took, um, uh, Glenn speaks about my opening night in, in Seco Loco, and uh, Jesse Chen, he was there. Um, I had never been to the island. I had actually never even seen a video of Seco Loco. I'd actually never seen a set from Ibiza ever. Mm. Uh, my understanding of Ibiza was what Euphonic and Fresh were playing. And even before I left, I called Themba, I said, man, give me some music. You know, I'm going to the island, you know, basically I'm going there to play 
what my what I think you know um, Ibiza plays, but I, I went prepared. My my folder was quite open. You know, I got into the space. We got early. I was with Glenn and checked the place out. I played, um, and there were mixed feelings. You know, there were, there were mixed feelings. And um, so we, we kind of like then waited to see if there's going to be another invitation. You know, uh, and I also, after playing and being there, realized that um, I showed them that I'm a, I'm a good DJ, which is, like I said, what we possess. But there were moments that were unnecessary you know, on my set. And um, so I was crossing fingers for the next invitation where I was like, I hope they bring me back again because it's, it's one of the most important clubs in the world, if not the important. And by the grace of God, I got another invitation, which then I knew that, okay, now I'm, I'm really ready, you know? And, I, and they gave me like a very weak set because they were not sure if, mm. you know, I'm going to, you know, be like a super busy DJ that I was on, on the other set. And I got there gracefully, so I was ready and I did my thing. And that led in, into more sets. Uh, it led into me actually being kind of like the main act, closing, you know, um, getting the main slots, you know, because I then got to understand, you know, uh, what was needed. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to me getting residency. Um, I had been uh, from the best school in Ibiza, Seco Loco, the most respected club there. So I knew the integrity it carries. Mm -hmm. And um, I took that with me, you know, even though high is like 6,000 capacity people every Saturday. But I adjusted my head to see a small room. Mm. And the first night where Glenn was, was huge, big stage, we're all up there. And it felt a little bit disconnected. It was a great start. Then we started fixing things. We moved the booth. I took it down to the people where it was closer. So when I play, I see people here. It's not like, it doesn't feel like a big room. Mm. But what it really took is understanding how serious it is. Mm. You know, from me just on a weekly basis, looking for music, talking to producers, I employed someone to find me music weekly. Mm. So every Thursday, I get a folder of music unreleased from different labels, from different producers. So that's, I feel like that's a step that really uh, helped me to get into a space where I am, where I knew that now I am in a different league, mm. you know, and I have 18, 19 shows in this one club where people come, I play four hour sets and more mm. people come to hear me play. I need to be better every weekend. I need to understand, you know, I, I, it was embedded in my brain that this I have to do and I have to do it well, mm. you know? So it went from being, who is this guy? You know, cause people all of a sudden there's a billboard with black coffee. Mm. They didn't see me for a long time playing with other DJs. So I'm not from Europe. I'm not a familiar name. So then people come to the club to kind of like, let's try it out. Mm. You know, it went from there to people being there every weekend. Mm. You know, uh, I think last year we, we had the, the most successful night on the island. Mm. You know, uh, but it took me like owning up to that responsibility to answer Glenn. It took me understanding that now I need to play on the highest level. Mm. I need to get music on the highest level. I need to silence the noise, basically. Mm. That's what it took me to just silence all the noise, 
it took me relearning as well. Mm. Like everything I thought I knew, I had to start from the beginning and understand like what makes people on the island tick. You know, in South Africa, it's the rhythm because yeah, there's, there's always a new dance. Yeah. So songs depend on the dance, you know? Yeah. So if you play a techie song, the dance doesn't work. Mm. You know, there's always a new dance here. And then you understand the groove, you know, like, so you play, you find songs that have the groove so that you can accommodate mm. the dance. And there, it's not that. So I had to learn, yeah. but also in between, what are the songs that have grooves that could work? Because mm. I wasn't there to just follow what everyone is doing. So it took me really, really like studying the place and unlearning and doing a lot of unlearning and, you know, like learning more of like the arts of DJing. You know, it just, there's books that I read about DJing back in the day and it, they even made more sense now because this is where I was, you know, on like the world stage and, you know, so, yeah. And um, I'm glad actually you, you went into the, the energy and like uh, the idea of a big room and a small room. And I've heard you talk about that in interviews as well. And I want to ask you actually from, I mean, a lot of South Africans, especially deep house DJs <laughs> and deep house lovers, right? We, we've got a certain passion and I, I love that passion because it's raw and it's there. It's kind of like a part of us, what makes us tick. But there it also yeah. is another element of it that is kind of very negative. That is also very kind of like somebody who wants to step into a certain space will now get criticized by people who don't understand the space and who are not into that space. Have you ever felt ever, ever conflicted, especially with you coming back to play in the country? Have you ever felt conflicted about where you are playing and the style that the energy that you want to drive in South Africa? No, of course. I'm forever conflicted. You know, um, from day one, I was never um, and everyone's favorite DJ, you know, um, because my DJing comes from my background, my music background. So um, it's, it doesn't come from what the streets say. It's deep or oh, it's commercial. It, it's never been from that place, you know. Then I started music. You know, and then my understanding of things even became better, you know, um, and I studied jazz in, in the genres of music. Jazz is what you could call deep house. You know, like jazz artists are, I was having a, a conversation yesterday with Nduduzo Makatini about who's a jazz pianist, about that community. Mm. It's a community I come from that I had to quickly walk away from because like the deep house people, it's very limiting. It's very, um, it looks down upon other genres. Like jazz musicians are like that, you know, um, to a point where someone could be playing jazz and they can decide, no, it's not, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, that's not jazz, you know. Um, and then you find jazz musicians start playing for each other, start playing to prove how jazzy they are. Mm. And what happens then is it becomes a this revolving circle where I'm, on my next album, I'm going to show all the pianists that I'm the jazziest of the jazz, <laughs> the <jazziest laughs> of all musicians. And then no one's thinking about a normal ear on the street. 
you know, and, it's, and then it becomes more abstract and more abstract and more. So that's my background. I'm from that space where I understood that you, you want to be the greatest, like jazz pianist, cool, but can you work with other people? Can you grow your talent? That's why, for me, one of the greatest jazz artists ever lived was Miles Davis, mm. you know, who, understand, who understood music, lived beyond the genre. You know, um, he then we used to go to rock concerts and listen, and then he started playing with the kids. You know, he started fusing his horn, where he he felt it worked. For me, that's music. You know, there's no music genre that's superior than the other. You know, because you can sit and say deep house is the best. Someone else says, hell no. Yeah. There's no such a thing. Mm. You know, what's your best deep house song? And you press play. And the jazz artist says, no, this song is out of key, by the way. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's the truth. But it does not mean that it does not touch the person. Mm. Mm. So I think we all make music to touch people's hearts. So whether it's a classical music song, whether it's a jazz song, whether it's the most commercial song you've ever heard, if it touches people, then the box, the box is ticked. Mm. You know, so there's no music that's superior. And that's the problem with the, with the jazz artists and the deep house fanatics. Like, oh, no, that's nonsense. You know, um, Avicii. Oh, that's nonsense. Mm. And you watch an Avicii show, people are like crying tears mm. because they hear the music the same way a Deep House fan will hear Deep House. Mm. And um, so I ha I've had to understand these things, you know, mm. at a space where I thought, okay, maybe uh, Deep House is there, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But then you also realize that there's no genre that is deep house because it depends on the person listening. Mm. You know, I could mm. say this is a deep house song, man. It's so deep. Mm. And then you'll be like, nah, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Your deep is you know? not my deep. <laughs> yeah. And then China's like, oh, this song is so deep. Yeah. You know, and someone else says, no, nah, actually, you know, so mm. it's, at the end of the day, it proves that it's just music, mm -hmm. you know? And um, then what do you want to play? It's music, I play music, you know? So I can start my set here and end there. Mm -hmm. As long as all these songs, um, songs that I feel, that's what I play. So I've been like that DJ from the beginning, starting out, who was always different. You know, I grew up in the circles of Tira, Sox, you know, in, in, in Durban. And I used to bring my crates and sit and wait for an opportunity to play. And I wouldn't get it sometimes, you know. And then maybe I'll get a slot at six when everyone is going home in the morning. Mm. Because I was never a peak time DJ, you know, but then because I was a good DJ, but then I was also not an opening DJ. Mm -hmm. You know, so I've always been in between. I was never deep enough. I was never commercial enough. I was never uh, even commercial enough for gigs. You know, I remember a friend of mine used to work for SAB and they would do events, and but he was my friend. And so he asked me to come, like, let's go. But then he's booking other DJs, mm. you know, uh, because I, he didn't feel also that I was commercial enough to do the gigs. Mm. But what I used to do when I was making music, I used to give him the songs, he used to, and he would play the songs. And his boss became a fan. And one day his boss said, who is that black tea guy? <laughs> Can you book that black tea guy? That's how I got my first gig, because mu my music got in, not even in the front door. Mm. You know, the guy used to like, then he liked the mixes. He's like, but 
what's his name? Black team. Can, can we have that black team? That's how I got in. Sure. You know, but I've always been that guy who's always been in between. So in Ibiza, same thing. I'm still there. Mm. What does he play? And my answer is one. I play music. So the songs I play will have classical music inspiration, R&B, jazz, deep, whatever you want to call it. Mm. But in the end, they, it's a story. Mm. It's a journey. Yeah. Um, I love that because as well, um, one of the jazz artists that I could mention who's alive, who has had the most criticism from jazz artists is Herbie Hancock, you know, because of his bringing, yeah, yeah, yeah. His bringing yeah. in of the synth and, and, and playing um, an orthodox uh, type of yeah, sounds, yeah, yeah. you know, um, and jazz musicians used to go at him and, and look they at... They disowned him. Mm. They, they disowned Begum Selebu um, mm. in this country. And at the time, he was... Uh, one of my lecturers in, in, in Devon, and okay. he had done the most amazing album before he came back, and he came back, uh, did an album with Sheer Music. Homecoming. It was Homecoming, Homecoming or Home Against. Homecoming. They Homecoming. disowned him. Wow. You know, he's one of our greatest musicians to ever live mm. in this country. They disowned him. So I know the space. That's all we're talking about in the Duzo. Mm. You know, I know that space, and so when it comes to deep house talk, it's even the smallest for me because I've seen the, the biggest scheme of it. Mm. But that's why it doesn't phase me. Mm. But if you, I remember, did a mix on Lars's show. Yeah. That, that mix was the most talked about. Even before, he was like, next week, you're going to have black coffee. They were like, no, what is he doing here? <laughs> why do you have him? The day the mix came, it broke the internet. The entire system crashed. I think till today is the most listened mix. Yeah, yeah. And, and no one is going to come back and say, right, no, but this mix is nice. Yeah. <laughs> no one is going to come back to say that. You know, everyone is going to sit on the negative, like, no, he's not a deep house DJ and this and that. And that. But I'm over that conversation. It does not even phase me anymore. Mm, I love that. And, and you know what? The reason I love this so much is because that um, some of the people who will criticize you when you start, you know, shifting into your own space of what you feel is working for you at that time, the very same yeah. people after a couple of years will now be the ones that are saying, hey, I go feel blind. I look at him. Yeah, they learn. Yeah. yeah they you know. learn. But I want to go back a bit um, to Africa Rising. Um, and Besides the the big production that it that it was that it represented, um, for me, what that show meant, you know, seeing a twenty four piece orchestra with artists there and, and a live percussion. Um, yeah. I'm a former choir boy, so I, I used to sing for a choir called Molopo Choral in Mafike, and we yeah. we did competitions with competing against choirs like Durban Serenades and. Um, yeah. I'm from that school too, by the way. Yeah, 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 I know that you are a, a choir boy too. Um, yeah. uh, Devon Serenades, Houghton Choristas, and we used to compete against these choirs. But what really moved me about that space was being on the same stage as an orchestra. This majestic yeah. sound that you hear, like, I don't know, people, if you've never been, I mean, it's one thing to hear it on, on a recording, but to actually experience it and feel okay. it, it's, okay. it's majestic, you know. And what yeah. it, it, how do you feel seeing the end video of Africa Rising, just experience, even being on stage and experiencing the full orchestra and it's all, in its own might? Man, sometimes I watch the thing and I cry, you know, um, because at, at times I, I love building, you know, I love building and Galo is like the least performing company right now, you know, uh, and we've been having straight meetings and it, it excites me that it's the lowest, you know, I can't wait for us to build. So I love building so much and taking something that, you know, no one looks at and, and build it um, to a point where sometimes when we get to where we want, I don't even pay attention anymore. I move on. And I think Africa Rising was one of those things. And uh, so it, it took time for me to understand, you know, the full scope, 
yes, when I was on stage performing, I got it, you know, mm. I got it. I was like, wow, you know, mm. uh, but I still have the DVD. Every time I put it on, I'm like, man, this is unbelievable, you know, but because it, it's also just beyond achieving to have an orchestra, you know, it's mm. just showing how amazing our music is. You know, it's just um, you taking it uh, and giving it the best um, version of it, you know, that, that matters the most. And people watch that thing, I mean, and it changes the way they see me. You know, that was 2012. So everyone in Ibiza is like, oh, there's a new guy. Black Coffee. I even won a newcomer award <laughs> in the visa. Yeah. And that same year, my face was on a can of Red Bull celebrating 10 years in the country. Yeah. You know, and there was a newcomer. There's this new guy. And, oh, you're the new guy, you know. Yeah. Then they wake up to the things that I've done and then they see Africa Rising. It was done like 2012 with an orchestra, then it just changes everything. Like, okay, we, we, we understand why you're here. Mm. You know, uh, it's one of the most amazing things. And I'm, I'm forever grateful to Glenn, you know, uh, for um, being crazy with me, you know, because I, I, I do crazy things, like scary, crazy things. And it was a conversation, you know, like, this is one of the things I'd like to do. And he was like, okay, let's do it. There's very few people like that in my space. I'm always the only one who, who goes and just do crazy things. And he became that crazy with me, you know. Um, and we achieved like the most amazing uh, thing, you know, in, in, in my career, you know. Um, it's something I would like to do again, you know, as I'm growing. My music is also becoming more versatile, much more slower, you know, and I understand, I understand house music is a different space and I, it's something I love. I also understand that that's my DJ thing. Mm. My DJing thing is house music. My production thing is everything that I love. So I'm getting to the space where you know, one day I can do a song with just a piano and a violin. And it's in the album. Hmm. You know, that's the space I'm getting into where uh, I'm growing and understanding, you know, like it doesn't have to fit on my sets. Hmm. Hmm. You know, um, it's something I, I've always been obsessed with. Like, I don't want to do songs that are on my sets. Hmm. I want songs that, like on Tuesday, you're driving to work, put it on, listen to it, mm. you know. Because weekend is Friday and Saturday. Yeah. You can't only listen to me, listen to me only on Friday or on Saturday. I want you to listen to me all the time, mm. you know. But because of the tempo, uh, it, then it can fit into virtual set or um, uh, when Drake is having a private party, they can play this song. Mm. You know, it fits, it, it fits everywhere then. It's not a hard techno song. It's not, you know, like one of the songs that like Path likes is Time to Go. Mm. You know, and it shocked me, you know, when I was playing at his party, he kept coming, played the song. <laughs> and it's a song I don't even play anymore. I'm like, I'm tired wait, <laughs> I'm going to play it. Yeah. And he just kept coming back. And as soon as I did, he lost his mind. You know, and I love that. So, like, there's a song for everyone. Yeah. That's why when an EP comes out and people are like, mm, I, I'm not sure, I just like number eight. <laughs> sure. That's your song. You know, someone else is like, I'm on number two. Someone else is like, I love number one. Mm. That's what I want. Mm. You know, pick your song, hold, hold on to it dearly. Mm. You know, because number six, someone is holding on to it too, mm. you know. Mm. I love that so much. And... um Actually, you you touched on a point that I was it was I was conflicting with myself, well, with my album in 2017 because my album was more of a listening as much as it, as it was a house album, 
but it was a listening album you know it was very soulful it was very soft um a lot of live instrumentation as well but every time going to gigs even during the launches of the album where you get to play um, the main set at midnight or something like that and i can't play the songs of my album just because of the energy you know and i was always conflicted but i got to that actually it doesn't have to be i don't need to be playing my music at 12 or 1 a.m to a certain crowd that might not you know um the energy might not fit um yeah. but i want to get into something before I, I play you another clip from a friend um yeah. you are doing so much brother and you your success and, and you know you've just acquired galo and there's just so much in your hands you've got an investment company that i want to ask you about later but i want to know about m- mentally like because i i cannot imagine that anybody is able to perform at this high level all the time without having to need help or having to have mental issues do do you go to therapy like how do you get yourself back together especially in those times that are very difficult and and challenging from you um i the therapy thing is actually new kind of um um like that's why i was saying our thing should be at 10 because it's usually now at 11 and she sent a message <laughs> that she's ready when i am uh but because i'm talking to you today i think i'm going to just push it back a little bit okay thank you so uh, much but i i do you know and it took me a while to understand because there's a lot of things that things that have been <clears throat> confusing to me and then they started attack uh, uh, affecting me uh then i had to get a perspective from someone who's outside who doesn't do what i do uh someone i can talk to and say by the way is all this is what i did and this is the reaction i got and i'm so confused mm-hmm. you know uh why is happening uh, unfortunately there's so much envy and jealousy uh in our industry and it took me a, a while to get it because i find that it was coming from people that when i look back it's people that i brought in my circle i saw some things in them and i'm like man you are so gifted you know uh it would not be fair if you didn't get an opportunity you know and we'll start work we'll do amazing things and then the there's then funny energy <laughs> that comes and it's been happening mm. you know and then it ended up affecting me because i'm like but i'm the common denominator here mm. you know what am i doing wrong you know like um am i not communicating myself clear in the beginning you know um you know do people think i'm here to take advantage of them how do they see me because from where i'm sitting everything i do is from a pure heart and i want the best for them and and and, and. so it took me having these conversations you know to understand things better you know and I got to understand hence I said there's so much envy and jealousy I didn't see it like that before mm. you know and by the way that's a natural thing being jealous is a natural thing mm. what's not natural or what's terrible about it is when it hits you what do you do about it mm. you know if your friend comes and say Donna I bought a car today and you thought you were going to buy this car before he does because you work hard you earn more money and he buys it before you and it's a nice car and it hits you it doesn't sit good mm. what do you do mm. because it's natural mm. it's going to hit you a certain way 
what do you do with it? And most people do not know how to deal with it. When it hits them, then it strangles them. You know, then they don't know how to deal with it. Then you can't blame people who don't know how to deal with jealousy. Well, and these are things I had to learn, you know, um, because I would go back to the same people, try and fix, you know, and try and be better and try and do better, but it never goes away because they are struggling to learn to deal with it. So I've had to learn that it's not my fault. Yeah. I've also had to learn that my calling is bigger. And so sometimes I respond and immediately after I respond, I regret it. Mm. Like I wish, like I regret opening this conversation, you know, because the person I'm dealing with doesn't want the answers, doesn't want the solution doesn't want things to be better. Mm. You know, they are better pointing a finger. So if I respond, if I confront, it's easier to say, ah, they got out in the message I send you. Look what it's saying to me. Mm. It's better for them to receive uh, that kind of like attack and then they are justified. Mm. You know, so I've had to learn that my goal and my role is so much bigger. Uh, all I have to grow is a thick skin, which is the hardest thing to do. Mm. You know, how do you meet someone who was saying terrible, about, terrible things about you yesterday and you meet them, they're like, ah, good man, mm. <laughs> you know? And then he was like, ah, Banazu grand, mm. but you know, and then you must be like, man, shop, shop, do you need anything? I know grandy. I've had to learn that. I've had to learn to to know that I know what you say. I know the things that you're trying to do. Mm. You know, but it is not my fight. Yeah. Sure. So I will not bring it up. I will not. I will not. I will know, but it's not my fight because it's a fight I won't win. Mm. You are the one who's struggling with your jealousy. You are the one who's struggling to control your emotions towards me. And if I retaliate, I'm going to have to be blamed because, oh, but you are the hot man. Mm. So I've learned to like take the blows and focus on the goal. Mm. You know, focus on a way forward, focus on the things that I need to do. Mm. Yes. Oh. No, I, I love that. And, and I just want to say to people who are watching this, every every first Monday on this show, uh, every first Monday of the month, I have uh, uh, we have our resident psychiatrist, Dr. Gwen Tonyani, who advises us in different issues of mental health. And we deal with different issues of our mentality as people, especially as artists. So I think people should check that out. But you spoke about uh, friendships. And um, one of the friendships that you have is with the... Uh, a mutual friend of mine. I'm just going to play this quick uh, voice note and then we'll come back quickly, brother. All right. All right. Hi, everyone. Man. Uh, this is Usiana Makanya, uh, normally known as uh, DJ Kapila. Uh, which is Black Coffee. You know, we grew up together, you know, M Tata. Um, in a, a small location called uh, Nganelizwe, you know. You know, growing up in jail, like, we, we, we liked, you know, like, dancing, you know, and the music, you know. Um, yeah, man, I've always taken him as a bigger brother, you know, because almost most of the things, because he was a, a bit older than me, so I was always looking up to him in, in terms of, you know, um as the out ukula, yabo. So even with the music, yabo, uh, he has inspired me, you know, like uh, you know, to start yabo like this journey. Uh, yeah, man, you know, yeah, he's, he's always a guy with, you know, um, will tell you about, you know, this is what I want to do, you know, like even the stuff that is like really happening, you know 
breaking, you know, to the world, uh, being a, uh, playing in Ibiza, playing worldwide, you know. It's stuff that you would, like, you know, say, you know, like, I remember we used to, like, back in the days, like, I, I think we were, like, in, in Pretoria, we'll sit there and, you know, uh, you know, play one-on-one, -on -one and, you, you know, we didn't have any gigs, and, you know, you would, like, say, hey, you know, it's my man. Like just listening to YFM, you know, like listening to the guys like Abomo and the OV and the Christos, and you'll you'll hear that like you know like at Karnarilita it's gonna be happening, you know, and you you know we'll wonder like what's like about guys like Abo Vini, you know how, you know their their lifestyle, you know what I'm saying, you know what took them like to that platform to be like where they are like you know like onto superstar moment, you know, and you know one thing about him yeah well, it's 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 all about his discipline yeah well, into the of whatever that he's doing he's so disciplined you know and if ubege he focus into whatever that he wants to do he's going to achieve he's that kind of a guy yeah well. so he's a you know from from an early age man you know like he's always been that guy you know who's who's got the focus yeah, but all, and from now, like in J, like Jigwa say Kuli, the same Tala, Bolentanga, we're still looking up to him as much as like we are friends and you know, we've done everything, going out to parties, you know, we'll walk for kilometers, man, you know, like going to parties growing up, you know, Nalumchita, because we always follow the music. Yeah, well, thanks, man. Yo, yeah, yeah. Yo, yeah. man, that guy, that guy, we come a long way with that guy. You know, I, I just get emotional thinking about it. You know, we, um, we, we grew up together, and we loved music. And um, people don't know this thing about Umtata. Umtata was an independent state, like Bukuta Tuan. Yeah. So. It was different from any South African city. Um, it was run by black people. So there was no white people much. There was no apartheid uh, experiences there. It was like a small town. So where there was, um, the richest people were black, you know, so there were different classes of people, you know, and it, it, there's, there were big famous surnames and we were not those ones, you know. So we we came like if you told anyone who's going on in these, you you're not part of anything. You can't get into a party. You you can't have friends in certain places because you are from the lowest of the lowest places, you know, and. But we loved the music. So we used to like literally uh, go stand and study lift to get to town, you know, hope for the best. Skizzy, you know, smash, you know, like, you know, when we get there, we want to blend in, but see, and then someone stops in their van, we jump in the back, we go, we get to town, we walk again, get another, to find a party. Sometimes the party's in someone's house and all these kids are there driving their family cars. You know, some of them will pass us on the way and wouldn't stop for us. And we get there, we blend in, we forget where we come from, mm -hmm. you know. And in the morning, same thing. We're walking back home. The cars from the party, <laughs> they're coming, you know, because we were not popular kids. You know, um, but we just followed music. Mm. Same thing when then I moved to Pretoria, I used to literally, if I see a Glenn Lewis poster, uh, Christos, Fresh, Mosquito, I'll be that guy in the front who's like, just watching, understanding like, what makes him a great DJ? Mm. Why is he where he is, you know? And to a point where they started knowing me, like Glenn knew me without knowing me. You know, I was such a fan. I would go to his record shop in Pretoria. He would see me there, but he didn't really know me. You know, uh, Fresh, the same thing. So, roll with Cleo. 
then at that time I'll try to give them my my music, my demos, and you know. Um, then Monde, who was like a brother to everyone, the late Monde, mm -hmm. he helped a lot of us because he had a heart. You know, he was inconveniencing his famous friends a lot because he took everyone in like his own brother. Mm -hmm. You know, so he'll be plumbing like with all the famous people. You call him, he says, oh, no, come. You know, next thing you're walking in and all the celebrities are there and he's like, no, relax, you know. <laughs> and he took everyone in. Monday took all of us in, you know, as long as, you know, um, you had the talent and he took all of us, you know, in. And uh, it's, this was my school, you know, my education, understanding people, the dynamics, you know, um, later to getting to know Christos, you know, later to getting to know Fresh and Osquito, all of them. But it, it was pure, I was a fan, mm. clean, you know, proper. I was a fan and followed them around, uh, spent my last money at the door to go stand and watch and understand, you know, mm. what is it that they're doing. And this guy has been there with me since mm. you know we've been doing this thing forever mm. and as much as other people have uh, given you opportunities you you've done the same you know like for for a lot of other people um one person um now that comes to mind being the couple i mean he's one of the best that we have in our country i had him on the show you know and i remember very clearly he explained the story of how he was at his lowest point where he was stressed and depressed, you know, not having a way out. And we were at, at this gig, um, Vinny, uh, Vinny Da Vinci was launching his show in, in, in Niche in Rosebank. And that's when you guys yeah. met, you know, and he was like explaining us to the story, as explaining to us the story of how you approached him and how literally, you know, to him, that connection saved he, his, his life in a way, you know, like, and took him from mm -hmm. depression. And I really appreciate that about you, bro. But I wasn't, I wasn't, I heard about that story. I wasn't even aware things were that hard for him. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it pains me so much when I sit at home and listen to someone's music and I know like this guy way beyond my talent is so talented mm -hmm. and they're not getting the recognition. They're not getting the gigs. They're not getting the work mm. it pains me like there's a new guy now uh that i've been listening to the africa deep like i listened to his songs then i sent him a, a message i think on instagram saying to him man wow you know mm. and then he tells me his story you know like i can't believe i'm talking to you i'm literally crying i'm with my mother here i live in this chair and it breaks me, you know, when I, I know that, man, you deserve a better life. You know, you deserve at least a chance, mm -hmm. you know, at least yeah, you deserve exposure, you deserve. So I don't even think about such things. Me, uh, like with Dakar, I knew he was working with people and obviously you don't want to step on toes and someone is trying to help him build and then you come and so it took me a while. I've always known his dog, but it took me a while and also just tried to figure it out. Like, how? Mm. But one of the best things about the couple is his heart. Mm. You know, I've worked with so many people um, and their hearts betrayed them. Mm. You know, because there's a point where you have nothing and there's a point where you have something. And when you have something, then you have a, a crowd. You have people saying to you, no, uh, now you are here. Don't listen to this one. Don't do this. And for me, it's always like the same reoccurring conversation where when they get to a certain level, then people are saying, no, but Black Coffee is jealous of you. He doesn't promote you. Uh, why are you not playing there? Why is he playing there alone? And he's managed to silence that. Mm. Like, like no one I've worked with. Mm. 
like I've worked with guys and it got into that point where I've been attacked about such things mm. and they will sit and keep quiet. Mm. You know, it's like now what's happening in the world with the Black Lives Matter thing. If you keep quiet, you are part of the problem. Mm. So if you know I've contributed in a certain way in your life and I've helped you speak up, mm. you know? Or if you don't, do the right thing. Mm. You know, and Dakar has been, for me, that guy who, who knew that the noise is going to come. I am not going to entertain it. Because uh, unfortunately, our careers, music, music industry, we are like a low-hanging fruit. Everyone can tell us what to do. Mm. No one can tell a banker how to bank. You know, but with us, they will come and say, no, you're doing it wrong. Uh, who's managing you? No, 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 choose a better manager. No, don't release with that label. Go there. Don't do this gig. We are the lowest hanging fruit. Mm. And if you don't silence that noise, uh, it could be the end. Most groups in this country have broken up because of that. Mm. People come, they say, no, but you are the group. Mm. Mm. What does the other guy do? You just DJs, you are the singer, you are the one uh, who's writing the songs. Uh, you should be earning more than him. Mm. And they get to them, and then the groups, the group, most groups break up, mm. and then everyone suffers. Mm. You know, and so it it's a career where you need to be deeply rooted. Mm. You know, Dakar has been that guy. You know, um, up till this point, like his new EP is on his label. Yeah. You know, because for me, that's the future. You know, and I sat down and uh, before the, the Galo thing, I've been working on a music platform, Gongbox. We're probably going to announce this week because we are about to launch it with, with Huawei. So it's going to be pre-installed on the phones. Um, the, the way we try to structure that business is we want to change the way things are done. And one of the things is not owning artists anymore. My belief is no artist should be owned by a record label anymore. Mm. So it, then it started with me releasing all the artists on mine. You know, every artist should be owned by themselves. Start your own label. That label owns your master. Mm. And so it, it had to start with him. Mm. So I've helped him with this album of Ed and R.D. to kept coming back. And I was like, you know, take this one out. Do you have another one? You know, um, that year, Samoya song mm. wasn't meant to be on his album. You know, uh, that's why I love that story because it's a, a story of humility. Duduzo approached me. He has lots of music he's working on and he needs help. So I help him with other songs. And I took this particular song to, to Nico. I said, there's a guy who's going to take this song to the next level. Check out his music. Duduzo is a jazz artist. He's not exposed to most producers. That cover did the song. He did three different versions, I think, of it. Came back. Duduzo went crazy over the song. So it was meant to be Duduzo's song. And so while Takapo is trying to finish his album, I just thought, this is one song that could work for Takapo. Mm. You know, and I went back to Duduzo, I said, man, do you mind? You know, can I take this song and, you know, give it to this boy? Because he was like, for sure. I went back to Takapo. I went to Duzo first, and then I said, Takapo, do you like this song for your album? Because he could have said no. Yeah. You know? And he was like, for sure. I said, then give me the stamps. I took the stamps, sent them back to Duzo to add the final piano. Then back to Nico. Nico finished the song, and here it is. Mm. But the story of humility there is how he was willing to help Duduzo without knowing mm. 
that this could be his, like one of his biggest songs. Mm. He was open to help him to do so. Mm. You know? Mm. And in the end, we have that song out. Mm. You know? So uh, I've seen I've seen everything. You know, I've worked with almost everyone where I thought you deserve the best. I'm gonna tr- I don't have anything, but I'm gonna try my best, you know, to help you. And as soon as they get to a certain level, and then the noises come, then they doubt my intention. Mm-hmm. And the relationships always go south, you know, which is what we we're talking about earlier. Uh, I've had to learn to deal with that and understand that actually, even that is okay. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be a burden I carry, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. I always see myself as a vessel, like God just puts me in between to be the bridge. That's why I'm always open. I'm always open to help anyone because that's my understanding of it. Mm. I'm the bridge, you know. Oskido was a bridge to me, mm. you know, to start. And so I'm, I'm going to do the same just to help you go from there to there. What you do from there, that's up to you. Mm. Mm. You know, but I've seen humility and people... You know, saying uh, being humble is overrated. I've seen it change lives. Mm. You know, Nduduzo himself, he had shows in New York. He went to New York. And there's a restaurant in New York, um, in Soho, that I've invested in. And I told him, when you're there, make sure you go. They're going to take care of you. Go for lunch, go for dinner. And I told the guys, a friend of mine is coming. And he was busy. But he kept his word. He went. And guess what? This is where he got his Blue Notes recording deal. By going there and honoring his word out of conversation, you know, the guys that are my partners there, you know, were like, man, so we hear your pianist. And he's like, yeah, what's, what are you trying to do? He says, I want a Blue Note deal. They're like, oh, that's our friend. And he's like, yeah, but I've sent them music. They're not responding to me. They're like, man, listen. Uh, then the deal was done right there on the spot. It's just, I've seen humility, like being real, you know, like really, really changing lives. And, you know, most people don't understand it. And it's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, okay. it's something I have to understand. We are all wired different. And most of the people that I've worked with have made so many mistakes because Fame is, can be a confusing thing. So you can't also blame people. Like you, one day, I had a couple, you are depressed, and you turn things around. The fame is here. Now you have friends that you didn't have when you were depressed, mm. and you have the money to buy them six pack, <laughs> mm. and they have opinions. Mm. No one trains you. You know, you can't just have money and be wise. Mm. You know, so it's something you understand as well that fame fame is a dangerous thing for all of us. And so we adapt to it differently. Mm. Some takes time to get it, you know. Some it affects them forever. Mm. Mm. Sure. And um, I, I like the, the, the couple story. Uh, and, and actually, let me get to humility first because... Um, I follow Gary V a lot on Instagram. Some people might know him. And he pushes this kindness and humility as being like the uh, uh, utmost strength, you know, um, as mm. opposed to in the past where people used to be like, you know, kindness is a weakness. It's not a weakness because if yeah. you are not kind to someone and nobody knows what life has, you know, in, in store for us, anything can happen in our lives that might change the, 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 the way things work that might change our lives completely even, you know. But if you were kind to somebody and you were at least a nice person, you have more chances for that person to be helped by other people. And not to say that you are being kind or being nice so that you can be helped, but just the energy yeah. of you putting it out always comes back in one form or, or another. Um, yeah. Ranati, I want to ask you two more questions. Now. Like, but the first one is more about your... Your, your the record label that you've just acquired through your company flight mode digital 
Um, you've yep. had a long term. You've had long term partnerships with Universal Music, and uh, you have now acquired the stake in Galo. What is your view regarding the role of major record labels, um, especially now that you also feel like record labels should not own artists, especially the masters? But then, what is your view? Are, are you purchasing Galo for the historic, um, his, the history that they have? Or there are other future plans with regards to um, having arti other artist music on 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 there. Um, let me tell you a quick story. Um, this kind of deal has been long time coming uh, in different ways. Um, there was a point where Universal Music wanted to acquire Solistic Music, and we had conversations, you know, and. We started doing due diligence and checking how much the company's worth. And I remember at Universal, then they changed management. Then uh, the guy, the boss then was, who became the guy who was running Universal was Kodman, uh, Lindeland and Keys. You know, he became the new guy in the middle of the deal. And which usually is a problem because when you have someone um, having a different vision and then they change, someone else might not have mm -hmm. the same. I mean, it's happening now with Galo. The guy who um, is running Galo now, we find him with plans already mm -hmm. that some of them we feel like, you know, we need to discuss, same thing. So. When the Nyanam Kiza became the one in charge, then when I sat down with him, uh, he just didn't think he would spend that kind of money on me or my label, you know. Um, so the deal never happened, you know, and we were close, you know, it was, it was quite an exciting time for me as it, it's something that hasn't happened to a young guy like me at the time you know, and I built a solid record label uh, with a big, like a solid uh, financial background, you know. Um, and then fast forward, Sony came. They also wanted to acquire Solistic Music. We had conversations and one of the things they wanted me to do was to move Solistic Music into Sony's, Sony's offices and become the head NR for Sony, something I knew I wouldn't be able to do. You know, uh, since I started soliciting music, I've never run the label. It's not my strength, and I've, that's how I build businesses. I want the best people to do the best job. My, I know my best job. I know what I'm here to do. So I knew I wouldn't be hands-on on the on the NR. So. When that deal didn't work out, work out, that's when they got Zex to do NR for yes. uh, Sony, <laughs> because we had a working relationship at the time. So to them, it was like, okay, if we can't get this guy, we gotta get the closest guy to him, mm -hmm. who also has the same music background, mm -hmm. so to say. And so these are conversations that happened before. So when these two deals didn't happen. It was disappointing from a business point of view because it was, it showed the potential of my business. Mm. What's the next step then? You know, um, should I wait for Galo to buy me or should I aspire to buy Galo? Basically. Um, but before the, the Galo conversation, I had been working on Gongbox and um, one of the things I wanted to do with Gongbox was I wanted Gongbox to be a platform that owns content. Like today in the world, there's no platform that owns a catalog. You know, you, Apple Music don't own, Tidal don't own, um, Spotify, no one owns a catalog. Mm -hmm. And that was for me, my dream that it would be so amazing if Gongbox owned the catalog, Gongbox owned um, 
um, a 360 um, um, ecosystem mm. that can change things in the music industry. So if I'm in a space where I've acquired shares in Gallo, I've built a platform for the industry. I'm then in a position to change things because I, then I don't have to follow other people's rules. Mm. You know, that was the bigger picture. So acquiring Gallo was not the main deal. Launching Gongbox was the main deal. Gallo was a part of the deal moving forward. So we are currently um, restructuring how business is going to be moving forward. And I'm purely on the music, musician's perspective. And I told the guys who are wearing ties, I'm like, wear your tie. I'm going to come in with my sagging pants. We must meet halfway. So I'm going to be brutally for the artist. What would I want moving forward? You tell me how you're going to make money. But I'm going to be purely coming in as an artist. So this is where our worlds need to meet. But as an artist, can I have a medical aid? Can I have a, a life cover? Can I have an income protector? Can I have a savings for my child, children's education? That's the world I want to create. So you tell me how it's going to work, but that's the kind of a, um, a structure I want to build mm. where moving forward, we need to be better. We need to do better because mm. we do make money, but no one has created an institution for us where we make it work for us. Mm. Railroad companies are so solid. You know, but the other end, which is us, it's not. So record company will give you. Then it's up to you what you do with it. And it's not their fault that you're going to buy five cars the <laughs> same day. It's not their fault. You know, so how do I help an industry that has no education in that space through my own mistakes? So build a structure that is going to have a solid back end so that the artist can continue to just go, go perform, bring the money, but the back end is solid. Mm. That's, that's the future I would love to see. Mm. That's what I'm hoping to achieve with the, with the Galo and the Gong Box relationship and everything else that we, we have built around it. Mm. Right, I love this so much, uh, and especially the, 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 the point of artists really seeing this as a business and thinking long term about it um because like i mean Branati, when people see you and we see you know we see the the private jets we, we see you in the maserati you know what i mean like sometimes like yeah. m most of the time for aspiring artists like we don't really really we know we've seen your story but we don't yeah. really people don't really know that it's no, you did not start by buying a Porsche um, when yeah. you were doing a 5K gig at, at, back at the yeah. time. You know you had to work yeah. your way. And you're also not buying this, uh, spending 50% of what you have buying a car. You know what I mean? And, um, yeah. and I think that it's, it's so important to have the, the education. And I, I'm, I'm really supportive of your vision of Galo and for, for artists especially. I want to get into this point that when you started um, at um, a real tone agency as a, as a DJ, you yeah. shared a story that you were the lowest paid DJ at the time. And at that time, they used to have people like Rocco, people like Frank Roger on it as well. Um, yeah. And you, you were on this agency being the lowest paid DJ. What are like the lessons that we could give? Actually, no, before the lessons, I want to get just to this point of traveling. Can you remember a point where you were traveling abroad, you know, a part of a real tone, and you were not traveling first class? You were not 
oh, uh, private yeah. jetting. What oh. was that that like difficult one that was like, ish, now I'm sleeping in this place? No, I mean, it's a choice, you know. Uh, I still do it because how it works, um, there's two ways of doing gigs. There's, there's landed fees. Uh, a landed fee mean the promoter is going to give you an amount and in that amount you book your own flights and your own hotel and that's what we do so meaning it's my choice to fly the promoter has given me 10 rands so am i going to spend seven rands of that 10 rands buying a business class ticket you know and how many 10 rands can i get on a weekend or in a month so we work on that on, on, on that kind of system where all the fees are landed. Um, a simple, quick story, 2016, I was building a house. And I, that time I was accustomed to private, sorry, first class tickets. And, but I knew that I need money to build my house. I need cash to build my house. And so I told the team, no five-star hotels, no business class tickets for the entire tour. I was on buses, I was on trains, like anything to save money. You know, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm goal driven and my goal was by the time this the tour is over, I need to have a home. Mm. And so it's a choice, you know, it's, uh, and now when you get to the, the, the private jet space, it's, it's another choice because it's a landed fee. So when you combine all these fees, how much money do I have? And what does flying, flying a private jet mean? Does it mean more kids or is it luxury, mm. you know? when I have it, how many shows can I then cover? You know, uh, and it, at this point, without a private jet, I would actually make less money. So, um, but it's all gradual. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Lionel is, is the best in the game. And we've grown together and every move we make even at times where i think i'm right i'm like man what do you think mm. i trust his opinion so much he does the same when he thinks we're going what do you think sometimes i'm like no mm. you know sometimes he comes with something and he thinks it's gonna be a yes and it's a no and sometimes it's a yes and he's shocked like why 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 did you say yes and I explain how I see things. Mm. So that's why it's been so unique. Because I also had to educate him about where I come from. You know, and what certain things mean. And early, he understood it like a poster. Mm. You know, from the beginning where then they put like the drums and then my face, they paint, they put I said, we, 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 I don't, that's not where I come from. Yeah. You know, and that's where people think I come from with the face mask and, you know, mm -hmm. that's not where I come from. And it's very important to make sure they understand that. Mm -hmm. So we approve every flyer. Mm -hmm. If anything, we, we, we're going to design it ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so that the story is always told right. And that's how we do landed fees because we don't have to tell the promoter, we don't want to sleep there, we want to sleep there. Mm. So we sleep according to our board budgets. Mm. You know, depending on what we're working on, you know, we're going to fly according to our budget. What do we need? If I'm going to do four or five shows a weekend, I can't do economy then. Mm. You know, mm. and long connecting flights, I can't do economy because I'm not allowed at the lounge. Mm. So all the decisions that we make, uh, it's, it's never about luxury. Mm. It's about how it's going to work in the end. 
you know. So when there's a church, it's not because of luxury, it's because there's more earnings, or we want more earnings, and meaning we can do three shows on a day. You know, like we can do festival, festival, closing sets. We do three countries in a day. Then that money is able to, to, to pay for it, you know. So, but it's all been strategic. It's all been, like you are mentioning, I was once like this, the youngest artist, which is what I love about Gallo, because I love building, you know. I, I love being the underrated guy. I love that, you know, it, it gives me so much drive and um, something I spoke to Gary V about, like I love um, being the small guy in the room and growing, you know, it's something I have passion uh, for. Mm -hmm. So that's how we structure things, like this is how we grow and, and people come early to understand things different. Like you were saying, my first car was before. I had a first car, like Greg, Cisco, Chrysos used to drive me to YFM. I had to do a 30 minutes mix, 25 minutes mix. They used to drive me to gigs if I had to. And eventually when I could buy a car, it was a polo player, you know? And um, I've made the mistakes too, of going from there to a band and another band and another band. And I've seen how it affected me financially. And I've seen at the same time how it affected me drive-wise. Mm. Because being black and coming from where we come from, we want to tick that box. You know, having a car in the family is the biggest thing for black people. Mm. And you can't ignore that. Mm. You know, you cannot. You want to tick that box. And I'm saying, Ticket. You know, once you've ticked it, now, what other boxes can you tick? You know, uh, where can you go that your parents couldn't? You know, career-wise, with your moves, how can you improve your life and your family's life? Mm. These are the next boxes. Before you get into a fleet. Mm. You know, and most guys make that mistake of they want a fleet of cars. And uh, without thinking... A car was a goal that I couldn't achieve. And taking that as a goal, let me find another one. Let mm. me not stick into one, because now you, you know, I, I gave Heavy K a call once when he was building a big fleet and I have him on WhatsApp and I saw him posting with the Ferrari. He took a picture and I immediately called him. In fact, I sent him a message. I'm like, man, let me know if you have time, I want to talk to you. Because now you've passed that stage of thinking, I can't achieve buying a Ferrari. Mm. So he took a picture with it. Like I said to you, there's no way God will show you that and you can't have it. Mm. So I knew that that's what's next. Sure. So I said to him, you've ticked that box already. You've pushed yourself enough, you know? What other boxes can you now uh, tick? As unfortunately, we don't have people who can teach us and tell us these things. Mm. So I had to have an honest conversation with him, mm. you know? And it's conversations I've had with other artists, but then they're like, ah, but what about you? <laughs> you know, and then I have to go back and say, but where were you in 2015? You know, mm. sorry, in 2005, when I released my first album, that's how far I come from. Mm. You know, so don't compare me and you right now. We can be on the same line now. You know, we can be on Twitter and, and you can seem like you have a following, but we are not the same. You know, and it's, it's a journey, you know, and it's going to take us a, a lot of time to also understand. And I've seen artists coming and then um, grateful. You know, uh, last week there was a big thing with Prince KB on, on Twitter. And first time I met the guy was in Bloom. I was playing in some gig 
And he was waiting till I finished to say thank you. He had dreadlocks at the time. Came, introduced himself. You know, thank you so much for supporting my song. You know, better days. I've seen it everywhere. You've been playing it everywhere in the world. Like I said, he doesn't owe me anything. Like, I see myself as a verso. You, you great, come, let me show the world how great you are. You know, fast forward to last week, I felt like I was dealing with a different person and I actually was, but I didn't understand, you know, so I came unprepared for this guy, you know, and it was one of the biggest lessons to learn that do not go into that space with people. You know, uh, your, your vision is going to be so misunderstood uh, by people who actually don't even know you. Um, and it's okay. You know, so when I saw his last tweet about, you've never liked me, and then it made sense. And I felt sorry for him now. Because how did we get to that space where you don't think I like you? But you were the same guy who came and said, thank you. Mm. You know, uh, even when Come Get Your Life came out, it came out at the same time when I did this song with Msagi, you did a song with Msagi, and your song was like commercially viable. Mm. So I played it everywhere still. And he posted me playing the song still, still saying thank you for the support. You know, um, but still there was an underlying issue that was sitting with him where he felt, you know, um, I don't like him. Mm. You know, and it's something I was not aware of, you know, and because I, I every now and then will tweet and acknowledge people. I will tweet and say, that couple is so dope and I'll do a post on him mm. and, you know, and having this kind of platform, you know, I want every DJ, every producer who comes from this country to, you know, understand that I'm, I'm not the father of the industry, yeah. you know, because that's another thing, you know, when you feel like a guy doesn't acknowledge you, isn't that a misplaced thing? Mm. Am I the one who's supposed to acknowledge everyone? <laughs> Do I have that power really to, like, am I anyone's father? You know, like, I'm not, mm. you know, but with that being said, I'm that guy who appreciates and I want to use this platform to, you know, for guys who don't think I appreciate, mm. I appreciate everyone, you know, because we are in an industry today because of all these different sounds, you know, Heavy K brings something, Prince KB brings something, Shimza brings something, like, we all bring something. So uh, at, at the end of the day, we bring something mm. equally to make this genre a South African genre. Mm. So I'm using this platform to tell everyone, like, I have no problem with anyone, mm. you know, um, whether locally or internationally. Yesterday there was a, a live video on Sunday, Bodhisattva talking about Afrobeat, and how South Africans have taken it and dumbed it down, you know, to um, what it is today. And, you know, he does not get an acknowledgement as a guy who's been there. My brother, I love and appreciate you and your contribution in the game. You know, um, just in case people don't think they are appreciated, mm. you know, I'm using this platform to tell everyone that I'm here for that, you know. Mm. Uh, if you have a song that, you know, fits on my playlist without any doubt and any question, I will play it, mm. you know. Um, I'm giving everyone flowers, basically. Sure. Mm. You know, so that it's not misunderstood and uh, people think I'm for certain people and I'm not for certain people. I'm for everyone. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm making the moves that I'm making because these are the moves for the entire industry. Mm. I 
I love this so much, bro. But I, I have to ask you if you if you listen to my song because I sent you a song and I saw you downloaded. No, I did, I did, I did. I love the song. No, I listened to it. Cool, cool. That's why it was easy to find your link now for this thing. Dope, dope, dope. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, when I saw, I want to ask you quickly about clothing uh, and, and Jewish, because I saw. I remember I was at um, at uh, Saint uh, when you had your 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 brunch. And a friend of mine was DJing then, and, and we stayed a while and up till she finished her set. But I saw people coming from there. Then I went on social media, and everybody yeah. was dressed up. And I told China, I'm sure like you could just tell Hong Kamunate that, like, just by the look, <laughs> <laughs> you could see, like, oh, sure. hey, hey, yeah. <laughs> but like, what, what is your thing about, about clothing and, and, and looking so stylish? Um. I, I think style is something you you born with. Honestly, I know a lot of people who, with lots of money who still don't get it right. I'm 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 on the fortunate side to uh, have found my thing because that's another thing. Style is you you don't dress like everyone. You, you just sure. believe in your thing and you follow your thing. And other people will think I I wouldn't dress like that. You know, and it's okay. Mm. You know, it's it's a way of um, expressing yourself, and it's something I've always loved. You know, one of the things that I'm working on um, is a clothing label. You know, we've established a, um, a shop called Yawa, and opened it in Cape Town as a pop-up store, and uh, we're selling uh, international brands. But the bigger picture where we're going with it. Yawa is a clothing brand and it's our brand. And the plan is to open a shop called Yawa where we're going to house local and international brands. So the way I do things, it's quite weird. I work backwards. Like I think of a 60 year old me and think at 60, what do I have? What do I love? And so in, in my portfolio, this is the kind of car I have when I'm 60. This is a, um, my property profile. You know, I want to have a farm. Uh, I want to have an apartment in the city, maybe in certain cities, I want to have a house. So then I start working towards these things now mm. so that when I'm 60, I have them, you know? Mm. So Yawa is one of those things where people are like, but why is it called Yawa if it sells international brands? because it's been done backwards. By the time it launches at a shop, you are accustomed to it. By the time it hosts all the local brands, you are accustomed to it. You know, So most of the things that I do today are because it, it's written already and it's, it's coming, it's gonna unpack as it goes. That's why the Gallo deal and people were like, wow, we didn't see this one coming because there's a gong box thing, which is a bigger picture. You know, so I work like that, and um, I, I love clothes, man. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping one day we're going to be confident enough, enough as a continent to um, have quality things that compete. You know, and I, I tweeted this the other day. I, I was wearing a, a mask, and it became a big thing. I went, "Why are you wearing a Louis Vuitton <laughs> mask?" And you know. Uh, so I have a friend in, in LA, his name is Itai. Itai uh, uh, is a creative. And what he does is he he goes and he buys things. Like he will go to Louis Vuitton and buy maybe 100 towers of Louis Vuitton. And then he'll create things out of them. Mm. You know, so he created those masks and he made them to raise funds for Corona. So he sent them to different people. So he sent me the mask in. So I'm wearing this mask in. Then I got a backlash for why you're not wearing a stretch mask. You are South African. And first of all, I'm not gonna wear a stretch mask. <laughs> you know? Like honestly, you know, because you there's things that you know you like. So I don't like a stretch mask. <laughs> like I don't care how patriotic you want me to be. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that was a conversation. So, yeah. And I, I said to them, I wish we can get to a space where 
we actually do cool things where we don't have a conversation where you are forcing me <laughs> to wear a stretch mask so I can look South African, you know? Sure, sure. You know, and sure. it, that's why we're building a business, Yawa. Mm. Yawa is going to be that clothing label that is going to sit with anything in the world. And I'm hoping we, we create uh, a lot of, like, local labels that get to that point where... Mm. No one has to force you. Oh, no, it's local, buy it. But I'm like, it's shit. <laughs> it, is, it is local, but it's not what I would wear. Sure, sure. So I'm hoping we get, and it's, it's another business that I'm building. Mm -hmm. You know, where we, 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 we apply ourselves in the quality now. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can make sweaters. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can make T-shirts. You know, but how can we make them to be comfortable enough and that you can wear it anywhere without being forced mm. because it's a South African thing, mm. basically. Sure, sure. You know, so at, at the branch, the suit that I was wearing is, is designed by Tsepo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Tsepo, you know, uh, from... And now I must explain that actually, you know, I do wear local things. <laughs> you know, every time I'm actually wearing a suit on my kids, it's done by Tepo. Sure. You know, all of them. I, I mean, because he does them well. And I want us to get to that space where we have these things and they're all done well. And we're not forcing the, the South African thing. No, you know, it just, mm. it must be good. Mm. He's from um, RFM Tailored Suits, right? Yes, but yeah. it's like, I'm going to force you to play local music, even if it doesn't, it's not mixed well. And... It's an MP3 from WhatsApp. 96 kbps. <laughs> yeah, so, and I give you the song and I say, go play it at high. And if I say no, you're like, no, you're not patriotic. It's a South African song. Man, sure. come on. <laughs> sure. I hope I, I will, by the time um, uh, Yawa really kicks in, or even if it's a later time, this brand right here would have grown into something bigger. I've been seeing it, man. Yeah, Bre man. Bread for soul, right? Bread for soul, yeah. yeah. I'm really working on yeah. it. We, we are, I've been seeing it. But that's the work. kind we want. I mean, Kapila has got his one. Uh, music will save the day. Yes, yes, yes. You know, those are the kind of things that we want there. To even a point where we we are willing to, when the time comes, to create small capsules that are collaborations. Mm. So if you have a brand and we feel like your brand is dope, but it's not of the quality, then we can collaborate on a capsule. You know, so that it sits, it can sit next to the other brand in the in the store. Mm. So that's the plan. Um, that's what we we're working towards. Ah, thank you, brother. I think uh, uh, we've 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 talked uh, enough. Even though I know you need to get to your your session. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's it's it, it was an hour. It's gone. It's I'm gone. gonna phone and apologize. <laughs> yeah. uh, but this was therapy for me. You know, to be able to speak. Uh, I always shy away from. Um, bringing people's names because then it, it always seems wrong. But mm. as long as it's done right mm. and I speak my truth, you know, um, it felt like therapy for me to be able to speak about the Prince KB thing, mm. about the Bodhisattva thing, about the industry, you know, and mm. the things that I've been through and the things that we've all been through mm. because. There's no written book about what we do, mm. you know, about what you do as well. This is all new. We are trying. We are trying to build each other. This is why I agreed, mm. you know, to be able to speak to you. It's not a TV show, mm. you know. It's something that you're trying to do to take the culture to the next level. Mm. All you need is support. And that's what we all need to mm. understand that we are the new generation. We are all trying to figure this thing out. Mm and we are all trying slowly uh, to um, um, grow. Yeah, but I have to run now. Yeah, I have yeah, a no, for thank you so and much. Thank you so much. Khrutman, <laughs> I appreciate it. Khrutman. Yeah. Thank you, Chiam. Hola, Pranati. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you. 